Um, so uh, Neil is a native New Yorker, photographer, Strand veteran, and longtime friend. So I'm so thrilled to have him here. He started working at the Strand in the early 70s, my, in 1970s. My grandfather hired him, and we have our mats here. Um, and he's taken on, he took on about every kind of job, including cashiering, shelving, and then they found out he had carpentry skills, so he was recruited to build most of the pine wooden bookcases here. Um, then you left, you took a job for about a year with an artist, in, and you were working in their dark room. And um, in 1977, my grandfather died. I was working here at the time, and my dad called Neil and begged him to come back and help man the uh, buying desk alongside of him. And for those of you who know, the buying desk is the epicenter of the Strand. Um, and then Neil rose up to become a, a vice president here. My dad, as I said before, grew so fond of, of Neil, really considered him like a son. And I don't know, something was going on astrologically because they both share the same birthday of June 28th, which I always think is a little odd. But <laughs> anyway, he's a remarkable artist from photography to carpentry. His boundless uh, craftsmanship excludes from him. His work has been exhibited widely since 1982 and can be found in uh, New York City collections of MoMA, the Met, as well as the Museum of Fine Arts in, in Houston, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Denver Art Museum, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and uh, my mom and dad's living room. <laughs> they have the uh, giant purple uh, flower portrait, the irises, yes, and they're so proud of that. And I even remember seeing, um, so surprised to walk into Penn Station in the late 80, 1980s, and there was Neil's beautiful work, the uh, people and their objects that was um, illuminated, and then also the picture in the, in the Long Island Railroad, too. That was another exhibit was, with the trains. With trains yep. So I'm just so proud that, to have Neil here to share his new book with us, Dogs, Portraits, and Objects. Uh, this uh, collection is a series of magnificently bold and intimate studies in both the ordinary and the occasionally extraordinary beings and objects that have defined New York for decades. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to longtime friend Neil Winokur. Thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, I guess, uh, I want to ask you. Do you want? I can start asking you questions. Okay. <laughs> you, you can do it on the fly. You can do it on the. Anybody have any questions for me? <laughs> Thank you. This is Alice and Olivier, which I think they do a great job with their materials. Sometimes the cut's a little weird, but so thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, I knew this was an art event, and I thought, oh, this, this reminds me of the, the color. Of the book. Yay. Yay. So, Neil, tell, tell us how you, like, tell us about your first photograph. <laughs> or what was the first photograph that kind of inspired you that you knew I, you could do it? Uh, actually, I don't think it worked that way. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no, because years ago I used to walk around with a friend's camera uh, in the Lower East Side in the early 70s, you know, and just take pictures of people in the street and everything. And uh, but I never thought of that being very serious or anything. But uh, Somehow in the, uh, I guess the early 80s, late 70s, I, uh, I, I, I left the Strand and was working for a photographer uh, who, who photographed art in the galleries. The, new, the galleries had just all opened in Soho. And I worked in his darkroom taking pictures. And uh, he's, on the, he's on the list. Uh, and uh, the unfortunate thing about that is, I don't know if anybody knows about printing black and white pictures or even color that you work in trays in a larger. And we worked on his, he worked on this old desk. So you always were bending over. It was really, had to go to a chiropractor every few days to uh, get your back fixed. Uh, but, uh, but, but, but working for him, he worked with a large camera. I learned about using a large camera. And one thing I always loved, when I used to go to the Museum of Modern Art, many, many uh, years ago, they had a, uh, 
in the old, they had all these old pictures that were all, um, they were all like, uh, what are they called, uh, contact prints. You know, where you take the, uh, the big negative and you make the picture write it. So everything is very, very smooth. There's no, you don't see any grain. Uh, whereas there, in, in the 70s, everybody was using, uh, you know, like a 35 millimeter, can, millimeter cameras. And the idea was to get a lot of grain. You know, that was very important. And uh, I w went the opposite way. I w didn't want to have a lot of grain. I love the nice, smooth, clear surfaces. <clears throat> so I was ready to start using a large camera, which I bought. And uh, I started by uh, taking, doing portraits of people in my, I used to have a loft on 18th and Broadway. And uh, I used to take, have people you know, friends and stuff come over, and I take their portrait. I started doing black and white, and I realized it didn't look very good. And I, so I, st I switched to color. And uh, even though before then I always did not want to work with color, I always thought color was just about color. It wasn't about photography. It wasn't about the image that uh, people that uh, it wasn't very important. But at some point, I decided that it, you see things in color. So you might as well have pictures in color. Can anybody hear me? Cause yeah. I, yeah. We don't need this, right? Uh, so I started doing these portraits of people, and I'd have all these people who stop over my house. Like uh, in the 80s, they were going out to clubs, to area, or to the mud club, or Max's. So they'd stop over on the way, and I'd take some pictures of them, and then they'd go out. And, uh, and I started doing portraits of all these artists and friends, you know, that way. and. Uh, that's how I began doing what I do. And that's, uh, after a while, I decided that, that uh, you know, people could dress up however they wanted. And you wouldn't know anything about them. You know, there's this headshot of, the, of a person. You wouldn't know what they really do. Do they work? Do they have a job? Are they a banker? Are they a floor sweep? You know, it didn't matter what they were. You couldn't tell. So I had them start adding their objects bringing their personal objects, which is supposed to tell a story about them. I call them totems, and they're arranged different different formats, like a triangle or a pyramid. And uh, they would tell different, tell things about the, the people. But at the same time, I also realized that uh, people could bring any objects they wanted. So it didn't necessarily, some people it could have been very personal, some people it wasn't personal at all. And some people, you know, I thought that everybody I knew collected objects, tchotchkes of some form or another. But it wasn't true. Hello, Robbie. You can let him in. Uh, but it, uh, it, what was it? Oh, but it turns out that not everybody did collect objects. Some people would borrow objects for the photos. Or I did Cindy Sherman, who, you know, Basically, all her objects were either pictures of herself or wigs, you know, which was really what she was about. So it was good, but it was like a strange to think that uh, not everybody had objects. So uh, that's that. Can that's you tell perfect. us about uh, Andy Warhol coming into the Strand uh, and yes. you kind of stalking him? <laughs> I, no, I, I, actually, I, I, I didn't stalk him, but uh, he, he used to come into the Strand all the time. I don't know if you know anything, Andy Warhol, he talked like this. It was very annoying to have a conversation with. But uh, he, uh, he used to come into the Strand and buy books. And he, I worked at the cash register. So I, I talked to him and stuff. And one day I got up the nerve to ask him if I could do a portrait of him one day. I was a photographer. And he said, uh, well, you know, give me a call. Or, or come by at the, because uh, he was on 17th and Broadway. And I was on 18th and Broadway. And show me your photos and we can talk about it. So what? Uh, so very, shortly thereafter, I did that, and uh, he liked them a lot. He was very receptive. He, uh, he, uh, he said that I, I should ca call him, and we could set up an appointment. And he, uh, he also offered to give me something, which I stupidly said no. He wanted to sign all these interview magazines and give them to me. And that probably would have been worth a fortune. And I said, oh, no, I don't need them. <laughs> Little did I know that I did need them. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so then I, every once in a while I would call him. 
and he was always either too busy or not there, and oh, another time, another time. And this went on for months and months. I'd call him like every week, every couple of weeks. And then I just stopped doing it because it was a little demeaning to always be begging or stalking, as you say. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, and then one day I was sitting around. I lived on 18th and Broadway with this woman and her stepson. And we were sitting around doing nothing. I said, oh, maybe I should call Andy. So I called him. He goes, oh, I'll be there in five minutes. I, I don't even think I had my studio set up to do photos. I never moved so fast setting things up. And uh, you know, he came in, and uh, we, uh, the woman I lived with ha happened to own this cookie jar, a little bear cookie jar. It was cute. And, he, and that's the first thing he noted. I guess he collected cookie jars. So we talked about cookie jars for a little while. Probably even offered him a cookie. Then he, sa he sat down for the photo, and he, uh, you know, he sat there. I did, took a picture and I said, oh, can you turn your head sideways? And imagine going like this. His idea of turning sideways was an eighth of an inch. You know, <laughs> he knew how he wanted to look. I, I think he more knew how his hair wanted to look. You know, his, how his wig would sit on his head. But anyway, I did take the pictures and it was very good. And uh, after I was, had them printed, I, I brought one to show him. And uh, what he did was, this is a big print, like this big, a headshot. And he looked at it like this, this close, as, as if you're looking in a mirror, going, what's that on my face? What's that on my face? And I, I just couldn't say anything, because, <laughs> you know, it was his face. <laughs> and, uh, do you, and ha do you have to have these artists sign a release back then, uh, or was that In, not in a theory, thing? you're supposed to have people sign a release if you do the portrait. Uh, but... but only if you're going to make money doing it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're going to sell it as art, no. But if I was going to, you know, sell his image to magazines or something and make a lot of money, in theory, I should have. I never, I never did took kind of releases probably very casual. because uh, I figured that if uh, Andy Warhol wanted to sue me, fine, <laughs> it would be great for my career. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, can, can you know, and in fact, actually, I'm doing uh, doing a project with this clothing designer now, and she wants to use my objects, some of my objects and dogs on her clothing, and uh, I was wondering if I needed a release from these dogs. <laughs> <laughs> but but, uh, but I couldn't. I, I thought the people who own these dogs are probably more than happy to have their the dog on clothing, so I didn't. Now these dogs are like internet sensation, you know, right, well, pug yeah, the, well, they dug the they, pug, they, and yeah, I don't yes. know. So. Uh, Matt, the publisher of this book, is here now. You want to take over? You want to come over here, or we, or, I, or, or we do we want to keep talking? Can you can you talk talk a little bit about the thrill, like what happened when some of these pictures were bought by MoMA, and like how that all transpired? Uh, MoMA used to have a policy, and I think they still do. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so just interested. interested. But, uh, <laughs> they still do that. Uh, you can drop off portfolios. Uh, what, a certain day of the week, and uh, you know, in, in years ago, people didn't do such huge photographs. So you, know, you could drop off a portfolio of 16 by 20 prints or 8 by 10 prints or whatever, and they would look at them, and they would go at the end of the day or the next day and pick up your portfolio, and uh, which is the same thing. I I used to walk around before I did that, the galleries down here, which did the same thing. But uh, galleries were worse because they, they either didn't they didn't talk to you at all, they didn't even say anything. They just gave it back and didn't comment whether they liked it or thought it was for them or why they did or anything, which maybe was good. But uh, anyway, so I dropped off the portfolio and a uh, uh, curator named Susan Kismarek spoke to me afterwards and said they really like it and they'd like to buy a photo, which was uh, great. So that's how I got into be their collection. And they've bought a few more over the years. They and what about the other art, uh, uh, the other institutions? Uh, Was it a similar other, situation? I think most of the other museums, no, they bought them through Janet. Okay. And tell us about Jan about how you met Janet too. Oh, how did I meet Janet? Uh, Janet used to work for a gallery named Robert Friedis, and uh, who actually I think she still knows. And uh, he was one of the early photography galleries on Lafayette Street. And uh, I guess I want, that was one of the galleries I brought my photos into. And they didn't show them, but sometime shortly thereafter, Janet contacted me and said she was going to leave the gallery and uh, represent artists, and would I like to have her represent me? Since nobody else was representing me or doing anything, I said, for sure. So uh, that's how I met Janet. And she used to have an apartment on Fifth Avenue, 
which, uh, and that's where she sold art out of. And then uh, at some point, somehow I got hooked up with Barbara Toll. I forget if I showed her work or something. I might have showed her work. And uh, she was mainly a, an art gallery, which I sort of liked. And, uh, and then shortly after, Janet opened a gallery a block away or something. So that was not really great, having two, two galleries very close to each other. Neither one happy about the other one. But, um, that's it. And how long were you with Jan Janet? I've been, what, when? <laughs> we're married. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm certainly our <laughs> oldest <laughs> artist. When did we start? 30, 35 years. That's a, really? That's a long wow. Yeah. I didn't know I was that old. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, here's um, that. I didn't even know I was speaking tonight. Um, <laughs> thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, uh, Neil, for you're welcome. coming. Um, <clears throat> I guess maybe I'll sit down. Uh, the uh, someone asked me. I was thinking with great seriousness recently. Like a powerful art person said, "What is the critical part of your practice?" And in so and like stared me in the eyes. And I feel in some ways I feel like that is a ridiculous question to ask an artist. And also I would like to ask you, Neil, what <laughs> what <laughs> what, is what? <laughs> what is the critical part of your practice? <laughs> Are you a doctor? I'm sorry. <laughs> It's critical. I, well, no, I mean, what, um, what's your work about? I feel like that's uh, another way of phrasing that. Uh, okay, my work basically is very, uh, it's about two things. It's number one, about me. Hmm. It's about uh, objects from my life, people I know, animals I know, and it's also, <laughs> but it's also about, I think doc phot photography is ultimately documentary. Hmm. And uh, you know that's how it always started out. You know, people doing street scenes and things, and uh, you know, not always exactly, not always exactly true. But uh, you know, sometimes manipulated, or sometimes things moved out of the way. But it started as a documentary, <clears throat> and I always thought that I was documenting the people I knew. You know, in the '80s, you know, all the artists I knew, and. And, uh, and, and, and then I, I switched to objects because uh, a lot of people actually really didn't want to see themselves in my portraits. You know, it's like looking in a mirror and seeing all your blemishes and all your little wrinkles that, uh, that nobody notices. I mean, if I do a portrait of, uh, say, you, and you think there's something wrong, one of your eye is above the other, you're going to see that. And every, you know, immediately, nobody else in the world would say, "Oh, look, Matt's eyes aren't even." <laughs> but uh, you know, so and then I started doing objects, and I like doing objects because they don't complain, <laughs> and they also, you know, it's very, you know, it's very easy to do it. You don't have to worry about how they look. Are they smiling or, you know, uh, shadows and stuff like that? And uh, so, uh, you know, I felt like Andy Warhol basically said that uh, every person should have their 15 minutes of fame. Mm -hmm. And I thought every object should have its 15 minutes of fame. Yeah. And there's a lot of objects in the world. <laughs> it's, um, so in some ways, your work is about, is autobiographical, but it's also about photography. And it's examining kind of the, um, uh, the way that camera vision, and in particular, I think large format photography, which you were talking about when I came in late, um, records exhaustively the surface of things to the extent that many people in your portraits reacted poorly to the, the detail that they were depicted in. Um, what about the brightly colored backgrounds? Is there a way that kind of the nature of studio photography or commercialism factors into things? Right. I, uh, well, I started off, actually, they weren't so bright because I used to use white backdrops. And it, with colored filters, and then someplace along the line, I said, "Duh, I can buy colored backdrops, and they'd be really intense colors." Mm -hmm. But uh, <laughs> people used to always say, "Did you pick your color as, as a psychological thing? Is uh, this this person against this color because it brings out something in them?" Right. And uh, I thought that was much too deep for me. <laughs> you know, it's like uh, I, you know, I happened purples happened to be working well, so I did purples for a while, and then I switched to pinks and stuff. But I, and you know, a lot of times if I'd be doing, say, a totem of somebody, and they have all these different objects, the fo the colors had to go together. So I wouldn't want to do a pink next to a red necessarily. And uh, you know, if I, or if I saw a sh was doing an exhibition and I was having all these, like I did my self-portrait, so all these objects were going to go around the room, so I had to think about the colors because they were going to be near each other. And this mm -hmm. is why I always have black frames too, because 
you know, if you pick a color frame, which is the right color frame for all these pictures. But uh, I also like the, black, the, br the bright colors because it does the same thing. You know, you're taking a picture of someone and you don't know whether they're a carpenter or an artist or, or anything or rich or poor. And if you put it in this background, you know, it sort of even tells even less in a way. Because hmm. instead, you know, not only you notice the person, but you notice this bright color. And uh, you, know, you think that might should have a meaning, but that has less meaning <laughs> than the person person does. Hmm. It's, it's, uh, I mean, there is like something Warholian about the way that you talk about your work and that um, I feel like he often spoke about things kind of very literally, which I think you do as well. But I think it's also related to kind of the literal nature of photographing people and things. I, um, do you feel like your photographs are like metaphorical in any way? What do you feel that the uh, that collecting all these objects from your life or from other people's lives is it a project that reflects like the nature of American society or consumerism? Uh, well, actually, some people who have written about my work think that it's about consumer consumerism. Yeah. But uh, it's it's not like I'm showing like really fancy clothing or really fancy diamonds or anything, you know, what you would think of consumerism. It's mainly basically things that people collect, p things that people wear, you know, your favorite pair of shoes, you know, your favorite ring or something like that. You know, it's not, you know, everybody owns them things. So you can say everybody's a consumer, mm -hmm. but it's really not, not trying to make people look like garish or, you know, there, I know there was a big, uh, a lot of people in the 80s doing portraits and they thought it was very important to make people look horrible. I, I, like I don't I don't particularly uh, I don't <laughs> want to mention any names. But I, I never <laughs> quite understood that, you know, why uh you know what what, what would what, what would be the reasoning for that? I didn't understand hmm. that. But uh I don't know. What well would, that seems documentary to me, like an effort to show things as they are without um uh romanticizing or in the like other direction uh, making people look aggressively ugly or something like that. Right, but, uh, right, right. I forgot what I was going to I mean, there's kind of a no comment. I mean, I know we're having a talk here and the point of the talk is to comment, but I feel like the way that you, um, you know, like similar to Warhol, there's this like, I'll be your mirror kind of thing where like you leave people with an object or an animal or a face or something and it leaves people to project onto the image. And right. you. Right. Yeah. And, and people a lot of times would, would buy a photo saying, I had that. It, there was someone who bought I, m my self-portrait. I did this butch wax, which people used to have their crew cut stand up with. Hmm. And this one collector bought, said, I used to use that when I was a kid. So he bought that photo. Hmm. And uh, someone else bought a photo of a shaving brush because a husband uses the exact same shaving brush. So a lot of it, uh, although it's my personal, it becomes their personal too. Hmm. So, uh, you know, because people can identify with it it's the same same thing for everybody but I was also going to say that uh, when you uh, I don't know there's the same thought like this uh, twice now I, I lost it so <laughs> anybody want to ask any questions or oh, yeah. add anything or mm. what David so the dogs the yeah, dogs okay dogs. actually the dogs are actually good because one day in the early 90s or late 80s I was sitting around my apartment downtown and I was home alone for some reason. The lights were low. I probably had just smoked some marijuana. And I just was thinking that everybody I knew had a dog. They had, <laughs> no, pe people had dogs instead of girlfriends, or dogs instead of boyfriends, or dogs instead of kids. And they took the dogs all over. I mean, now it's even more true. But then I, I, all of a sudden, that dog dawned on me. That, e that everything was about these dogs, and, and maybe I should just photograph dogs. <laughs> so I, I, I did. <laughs> I photographed all these dogs, and I had this show, and they ranged in size from 8 by 10 to 40 by 50. So like, you know, way bigger than life size and stuff. And, uh, and since then, I've done a lot of dogs. I mean, a lot of people find it very easy to commission me, to, to commission a photo of their dog instead of buying a photo of themselves or buying a photo of someone they don't know. But, uh, and, and, and the thing is also, it's, it's, it's a sad thing in a way, but uh, you know, dogs don't live as long as people do. 
know, so you have a do photo of the dog, and in five years, po possibly don't have the dog anymore. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? I wasn't thinking that. <laughs> have all of your dogs been photographed by Neil? Yes. <laughs> well. Yes. Hey guys, just letting you know, there is a mic for Q and A. If anyone would like it. So you oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. So uh, that's how I started doing dogs, and I did this one other project for uh, out 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 outback outback magazine. Is that Outland Outback? I think it is. I think it's the steakhouse. No. <laughs> Outside. Outside. It's a magazine about the outdoors or anything. They contacted me and asked me if I would travel around the country and set up studios in various different cities or towns, like in a motel, and, uh, and photograph all these rescue dogs that have saved people's lives or something like that. So I, I did that. I, I must have gone to about 15 or 20 cities. And, uh, and, and uh, the nice thing was, because it was all set up so quick at the end, I flew first class all around, which was good. But, uh, but uh, I mean, it was uh, very strange, because a lot of these dogs just didn't go inside, even going into a motel room. But uh, and some of them, some of the motels, like in cities, you know, were like big and had stairs and elevators. And a lot of the dogs just did not really feel comfortable being in an elevator. I don't like being in elevators either, but uh, but uh, but it, it worked out fine. I mean, I, I, it was a, a great spread in the magazine. I set up all these little studios and brought all these backdrops. It was fun to do. Did you try to do any other animals, parrots, cats? I. I've tried. I've done a few cats. I've, the first, the first time I ever did a cat was uh, this man named Barney McHenry, who my wife worked for for, for Reader's Digest. He uh, he came over. I did one of those triptychs where there's a big portrait and two panels with uh, objects, so it looked like a religious triptych. And one of them was this cat, and he brought his cat in, and he put this cat on the pedestal, and the cat just sat there like this. I took the pictures, the cat didn't even move. And I thought, wow, because I've tried to photograph my cats. Cats will sit for hours, but not necessarily any place where you want them to sit at all. So, uh, and I, I, did, I did photograph my cats at some other points, you know, by cheating and stuff, by uh, figuring out where they would sit and making that the studio around them or something, or put a little rug on the floor because the cat liked to sit on the rug. But, uh, and I did one bird, a parrot, a uh, cockatoo, in someone's house, and that didn't come out so good. I did a pig. <laughs> I should tell you the story about a pig because it's a pretty gross story. <clears throat> There's a magazine in, uh, I like the New York Times magazine, but in London. What is it, the London Times? Telegraph. Telegraph. But uh, it used to be, uh, the picture editor it used to be this man named Michael Collins, who has gone on to become a photographer, and he, uh, he decided and, and that uh, <laughs> he decided that Janet decided. <laughs> I made Janet be my studio assistant, be, and you'll find out why in a second. That uh, there was uh, all this information about uh, animals using animal organs to transplant into humans, and ma mainly pig organs, like you know a pig heart or a pig liver. And uh, so they decided that I would go to uh, what, what is it? What hospital was it? It was Mount Sinai or was, it was Mount Sinai Hospital, and I would set up a little studio in the morgue, and uh, they would, uh, <laughs> they would, uh, I, they, I, I would do a human heart and then a pig heart, and a human liver and a pig liver, and a few other organs, and the really odd thing was the human person was like, in her, who had just died, was in her 80s, very sickly. So obviously her organs are not very good. And the pig's organ was like six months old. They looked wonderful. So it really wasn't very fair, fair comparison. But, uh, but I made Janet come as my studio assistant. I figured if I had to do this in a morgue, she had to go with me. It was a great day. <laughs> it was a great day, right, right. <laughs> Well, there are many. You've done. You also did a commission for the MTA, where you photographed. Yeah, we uh, we talked about those. Yeah, I did uh, uh, yeah. the uh, Long Island Road. I did the employees and their objects. And you did something in a, a 
Porn Theater in Times Square. Oh, yes, yes. You've yes. done a lot of different commissions, which is why um, we published the book. Kuhn, who designed the book, is in the back row. And um, it was his idea that we should publish it in multiple volumes because Neil's archive is so vast that uh, we we didn't. It was daunting to think of trying to encapsulate it in even one large volume, and it kind of makes more sense as this modular thing where there are these projects, and your approach is quite consistent. So I think across the books it'll make sense. I I mean I was talking to someone recently who told me that he thought your great contribution to photography was the Totem series, which you were talking about, where you're, it's these kind of constellations of um, images, and this person thought that that was a um, you know, like a, a major contribution to portraiture that has been overlooked, and so I think there's there's right. a lot of there's a lot more books that we would like to make in the future, actually, of Neil's work. Right, 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 right. Because I've done a lot of big pieces, like my self-portrait is 40 photos, and uh, I've done my uh, my I have 20-year-old uh, twins, and I did a photo of them every year on their birthday until they were 18. So there's 36 of them, and uh, so I have a lot of these big projects that mm. could be a, a individual book. So we might eventually, uh, if we sell this and get some money back, maybe once uh, these are all so, once this is sold out, <laughs> right? But uh, and you guys are helping towards that. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, um, any, any other questions? Charles, you have a question? I, I, I do. Oh. Is that person going to speak first? Right. No, that nope. person oh. works already. <laughs> uh, I rem remember two things. Uh, they may be uh, unrelated, but I wonder if you could say something about them. One was your beautiful photographs of candles, and the second one was, if I remember correctly, you were a mathematics major in college, and I wonder if there's any connection between the uh, candles and mathematics. Okay, there's no no connection between Good. <laughs> That's just the answer I was hoping. <laughs> no for. no connection between the candles the, the candles and the candles and the mathematics. But uh the mathematics in a way led me to photography and I'll talk about the candles separately in a second. Thank, thank you. Because the mathematics I uh, I have a degree in math and physics and one day uh I guess in the 80s or late 70s. I didn't know what to do with my life. Uh, I, you know, I'd walked around doing street photography, but I didn't think I wanted to do that. So I decided that I would go back to graduate school and study physics and study physics on my own time. This is after years and years of a, a not healthy life in the 70s uh, that I would, I, I, would, I would learn physics by myself again. And uh, so I took off for a summer. I decided for a summer I would do that. And uh, after about a month or two, I realized this was definitely not happening. And that's when, that's when I switched to photography. <laughs> and the other thing, the candles, is it more about, uh, I had a very good friend, friend named Bill Jacobson who died of AIDS. And that was part of the AIDS, the show I did in the memorial to him. It was, uh, there were uh, photographs of candles all around uh, the top of the gallery, interspersed, I think, with black and white photos of all these people who have died of AIDS, and the rest of the gallery had weird, weird objects I wouldn't even go into. <laughs> but, uh, but that's where the candles from. The candles are beautiful, and I, every time I see the candles, it just makes me think of like a memorial. So. Uh, Can you talk about about being in New York in the 1970s? I know you kind of refer to it with people stopping at your home. Clubs and unhealthy lifestyle, but what was that like as, in this artistic community? It was fun. <laughs> no, New York used to be a lot of fun. It, I, I'm sure it still is if you're young, but as you get older, it's not quite as much fun. But then it was, uh, you know, you, you you could live fairly cheaply here. You could find a, a cheap apartment to share with people on the Lower East Side, and it wouldn't cost you much money and stuff. And uh, you know, uh, you know, you can go out to clubs and stuff. Yeah, I, I I imagine people could still do it but uh you know after that it turned to disco and all those other drugs and stuff and which sort of led into aids so it was sort of like the last almost uh uh I, i'd say innocent in a way it's like you know people just going out having a good time without without thinking of the repercussions because there weren't any repercussions at that point i mean of course there were if you did too many drugs and stuff but but 
you know, that wasn't what people were doing and stuff. That became later in the 80s, I think, and uh, into the 90s with crack and stuff. So it was, just, it was actually very nice. It was very free. There were all these little galleries opening on the Lower East Side and stuff. That, you, know, you know, so you'd walk around from one gallery to another and with your friends and stuff. It was, it was a very nice time. And you have, oh, yeah. Not the last question, but this, uh, another question. Uh, could you talk about your? Uh, could you talk about your travels to Morocco? Was that part of the same general in, uh, innocent exploration? Uh, yes, I. Uh, that was earlier. I. Uh, I. When I graduated college, I needed. I, I needed. Uh, a job to keep me out of the Vietnam War. So I got a job at Lockheed making military systems. It was a little, little silly. <laughs> so I did that for a little while and I had all these arguments with people because in the weekends I'd go to demonstrations against the war and stuff. Little did I know that I was making the war. But uh, so I, I couldn't do that much longer so I quit my job and uh, and, uh, and and got a, a travel to travel across the country and and then I came back and I got a job with uh, the New York Department of Social Services, uh, which was called welfare, giving, giving money to poor people if you can. Most of the time you couldn't. Earlier, before I started, it was easy to give out money and then that money got tight and they stopped it. But uh, uh, you're wondering where this is going, why this is leading up to Morocco. They, uh, they, at some point they decided, they, they just, they didn't give the workers a contract. They kept putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And the reason they were doing this was they wanted to give the people their money in one big lump sum, figuring a lot of them would leave. Because all of a sudden when you're, you know, all of a sudden they're giving you $2,000. There's a lot of money in the 70s when you were just making $100, $150 a week. And it had the exact desired effect. Tons of people left the job. I was one of them. And I went to Morocco. <laughs> And, uh, and, and a friend of mine also worked for welfare. He had gone to Morocco already, so I met him there. And uh, I, I, that's how I went to Morocco. It had nothing to do with photography. It had nothing to do with math, math or physics. It had to do with just having fun. You know, I was curious. Morocco was great. I, I, I hear it, it's still great. I think it's a different kind of great now. It's a much more upscale. But then it was, you know, you stayed at a hotel for $2 a night and stuff. And you just ate oranges. and smoked marijuana or, or just or didn't. No, it's, it's very, very, very easy. It was like the Paul Bowles lifestyle. Exactly, yeah. yes. Except was, he didn't yeah. kill anyone. Yes, and uh, didn't, uh, yeah. I love Paul. Paul Bowles was one of my idols. <laughs> He's one of my favorite writers. I own all his books and first editions and stuff. But uh, yeah, but I, uh, but he lived in Tangiers, which I never wanted to go to because I thought it was an evil city, whereas Marrakesh was not an evil city. But uh, eventually I went to Tangiers and decided it wasn't an evil city. <laughs> and then because, besides, yeah, yeah, right? But uh, yeah, Morocco was great. And I went back again. I went back there again. And I went to Egypt and Tanzania and Kenya and a lot of Africa and Indonesia. I like to travel. What's your favorite place that you've been, that you've traveled to? Oh, I don't know. I don't know how you can compare, like um, top five B Bali or Paris or Barcelona. Do you ever photograph when you're on vacation? I I I used to always bring my Leica with me, and uh, take say I would take pictures, and I never took pictures, yeah. and uh, so no, I, I'd say no. Yeah. You know, I, so, now I sometimes I force myself to do snapshots, especially these days now with phones. But these days, actually, I I always have my my children, my son, to take photos. Because uh, I don't do the best snapshots in the world. Does Anne <laughs> take the family photos? Or who what? does? What? <laughs> Are there, who photographs a birthday party at your house? Well, uh, if we do it all, <laughs> we, don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't do it. We photograph, I usually, I usually photograph Christmas opening uh, presents, and that's about as far as okay. it goes. I don't know. We don't photograph a lot around the house. I don't have a lot of uh, pictures, which is unfortunate, because I guess, you know, According to uh, the way art artists, you know, I've, I know a lot about artists' lives because my wife studies them and works on them, and they always have all these letters and all these pictures of them growing up and everything. 
I have a box of pictures of when I was a baby and stuff stashed away someplace. But all, all, the, all those other later years, I don't know if there are pictures. There must, might be snapshots someplace. I mean, I guess there's your own work, which you've described as kind of autobiographical. Um, and you two met because, how did you, uh, you met because Anne liked your work, I think? Or what, what's uh, the story? Uh, Anne, <laughs> Anne, uh, Anne worked for the, the, this Reader's Digest Corporation. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of their projects was this theater on 42nd Street called Playwrights Horizon. Mm -hmm. And what, the, what, what they did was in the lobby, whenever the, there was a show, they had photos or paintings, something to do with the idea of the show. And I guess one show was about women. So Anne was, uh, no? Not appearance. Appearance. Oh. <laughs> And 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 you know why we came to the opening? Because it was in a Japanese restaurant with free food. Free food. Well, <laughs> 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 whatever. Um, wait, there was a three person. It was you, Cindy Sherman, and Ellen Carey. Really? Oh yeah, I've published Ellen's work also. So that's strange um, coincidence. Um, but I. <laughs> I subscribe to all three of those artists, actually. Um, but that's interesting. And you've, uh, yeah. What is it like being married? If you're, right, let's delve into your personal life. No, but like, I mean, yeah, probably. But like, you're an artist and you're a curator. And is it, does it impact your, you know, what you talk about at home or something? Uh, do you talk? I don't know. Do you, do you talk about Rembrandt over dinner or what? You know, Gauguin. And, I don't know if we talk uh, about art that much at home. Um, you know, sometimes we do. If something comes up, you know, you know a show that Ann's working on or something I'm thinking about. But usually, you know, we just have regular conversations. Yeah. Oh, this dinner's good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, can, can you t talk about anything that was special that happened at the Strand? Like maybe you found a yeah. great signed book or some... Um, something in the book or celebrity besides Andy Warhol walked in, something that was really striking. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll tell, I'll, okay, that's what they, that's what they <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna talk about two things. I did kick her out, I just didn't hit her. <laughs> what happened? Uh, okay, but what was the other thing first that I was going to talk about? Oh, the other person who came into the Strand, a lot of artists came into the Strand, but Catherine Deneuve came into the Strand, and I was almost tongue-tied. She's yeah. so, be so beautiful. She's like standing next to me. And, but uh, anyway, let's talk about Courtney Love. <laughs> Courtney Love came into the Strand. And I, I don't know if she'd been there before, but a little quick background. Uh, these, this, these women who used to, when I did that 42nd Street project that he was talking about, I set up a little storefront, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a storefront on 42nd Street, I set up a camera with strobes and backdrops, and we'd try to invite people in from the street to do their portraits, which eventually went into the vitrines of all the closed theaters, like they were the stars of the movies. Uh, but the, the, re the people, two people I did this with were this woman named Michelle and uh, her husband, Bill, who were very big and tall, and I was considered them my bodyguards, basically. You know, they, they're very personable, and they got people to come in, too, but nobody was going to try to steal the camera or anything with them around. So, uh, which leads us to Michelle, who was a cashier at the Strand and a manager at the Strand. And uh, <clears throat> Courtney Love was in the Strand, and she asked Michelle if she could use the phone. And there are phones that she could have been led to that weren't be behind the cash registers. 
But Michelle, for some reason, let her use the phone behind the cash register. And I said, Michelle, she really can't be back there with the money and stuff like that. Plus, I think she was pretty high or something. But I, I didn't do too much for a while. And she kept talking and talking. And finally, I said, Michelle, she really has to get off the phone. And Michelle said, I can't get her off the phone. So I came back there. And I said, uh, Courtney, you really have to get off the phone. She goes, she just sort of pushed me away and ignored me. And she kept talking. And I said, Courtney, you have to get off the phone. If you don't, I'm going to hang it up. And so I just hung up the phone and took it out of her hand. <laughs> so, uh, so she got really mad. She goes, how can you hang up the phone? I want to have a conversation. I said, you know, you really have to go out from behind the registers and stuff. I don't think we ever even kicked her out of the store. We just made her go out from behind the registers. But this developed into a very big... Uh, there wasn't any violence. I thought, did she slap a $100 <laughs> bill at you or something? Wasn't that part of that? And not that I know of. Oh. <laughs> The myth. No, yeah, yeah, there used to be fist fights and going on the Strand, yes. Strand mm. was fairly rowdier <laughs> in the old days. <laughs> but but people, people are rowdier. Because these days, if people are rowdy, they usually have a gun, so you don't want to get too rowdy. <laughs> in the old days, fortunately, they didn't. Anything else? Any other questions? I have one. Oh, yeah. What is your next project that you're working on right oh, now? Yeah, right now, my project is, unfortunately, this renovation of my... Uh, this, ha this, house, this house we bought that's taking up uh, a lot of energy, and I don't really have a studio. But, I, but once it's done, which unfortunately won't be till next spring, I will have a studio in the basement, which will ha I'll have set up all the time. So I have a feeling that I'm going to go back to doing objects. I, 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 for some reason, I've been thinking a long time of just doing organic objects like fruit or vegetables or leaves and stuff like that. You know, but I don't know that I'll really do that. But I, right now, that's what I'm thinking, my next project. However, I'm open to someone offering me a, a, a commission to do a project. I will definitely uh, do that. I mean, I'm doing this clothing thing with this woman. But that's not new photos. I haven't d done any new photos in a, in a while. Right? Yeah, I've done you some commissions. commissions. Yeah. And you photograph your kids um, every year continually, That's right? Not, yeah, they, when they were 18, it was the last year I did that. that was a, they wouldn't yeah. do it anymore? Or you? Uh, I don't know. I always had thought that, I, they would, first of all, they wouldn't be around on their birthday because they'd be in college. It also makes it less morbid because I guess the, otherwise the end of that project would be your death. Um, if you continued photographing them. This is probably true. This is probably true. Now, no, it was never going anywhere near that far. <laughs> but uh, no, I had always thought that for some reason I would stop when they were 18. Okay. I would be interested to see your it, garden series. I feel like a lot of artists in, uh, late in their careers go to, not that you're late in your, it could just be the beginning, but uh, um, a lot no, of them turn to the garden, right? Like, uh, um, Monet. Well, <laughs> Monet. <laughs> Monet, but also um, uh, Woman One, or the, you know that. Oh my God, I, not my my mind. Um, well, he curated that sort of sculptural garden around the house where he was dying, and then eventually it just turned into a blue Who field. Is, who's this? Derek, Derek Jarman. I, yeah. Um, I don't know who he is. Um, no, but I'm. Uh, anyway. Uh, well, there you go. Since you can't think of anybody, I really should do <laughs> you it. You really should do it. Uh, well, we'll see. We'll see. You know, you know, or you know, maybe I'll, you know, do an, another part of my self-portrait. You know, from because my portrait went from uh, when I was a baby, pictures of baby, all the way up to uh, what 1986 or something, mm. 87. So I could do it, but uh, I, I, think I, that's a great I idea. thought of doing it. Continuing, but I didn't think the that later part of my life was any anywhere near as interesting photographically as that first, uh, you know, 30, 25, 30 years. It's you know, probably just different. Babies and kids' photos and parents' photos and drugs and sports stuff and everything. You know, later life became more about kids and stuff like that. So we'll see. We'll see. Maybe I'll make up a life and I'll photograph that. <laughs> um, oh, I'll find someone else's life to photograph. Yes? That seems like a good note to end on. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Neil, Matt, Nancy, thank you so much for this conversation tonight.